So 8.5 continues the idea of synthetic division. Um, and we're going to use a term called synthetic substitution, which is very similar, except it's a different name, really. Because the process is the same. Is that right? Uh, so we're going to use what's called the remainder theorem today. Okay, the remainder theorem, and then we're going to use something called the factor theorem, which you already know the factor theorem. What was the factor theorem from yesterday? Well, I didn't call it this, but what was the whole idea with factors? Where did that come up? Where did that come up? The point when there's no remainder, the quotient and the two divisors are, are factors. Yeah, okay. The quotient and the divisor are factors of the dividend provided the remainder is zero. We, we stated that yesterday. We're going to see that today with the factor theorem. Okay? So let's go. So in example one, all I want you to do is first determine f of three. Old school, right? We did this a long time ago. What is f of three? So take three, plug it into the function. Others agree, disagree? I mean, you could do it directly or just plug y1 as 3x cubed. I got 56. 56 rows? I don't know, I didn't know. Guys, I mean, in, if in doubt, plug it in Y1 and go to your table, plug 3 into your table, and you get F of 3. 56. Charles, 56, and Kelly? Okay. Right? I mean, plug the function in, F of X, plug that into Y1, go to your table, type in 3 for X, see what the Y coordinate is. That's what F of 3 is, right? Remember, F of X is really Y. So F of 3 is the y coordinate when x is 3. So anyway, use a table if you need to. It is 56. Should not take that long, okay? That'll be quick. Part B. Determine the remainder when f of x, that function, is divided by x minus 3. If you're asked to get just the remainder, it just means the number you get at the end. If you're looking for the fractional part of the mixed expression, you know, you get a quotient, then you want to get it. Yeah, so again, just the circular remainder, guys. Just this remainder. Remember, the remainder is just the last number here. The remainder is whatever the last number is right here. Mike, what did you get? So the remainder is then? What's the last number? 56. 56. The remainder you get is 56. It's not a coincidence. This is actually the remainder theorem. The remainder theorem is this idea here that if this answer is 56, this is really doing what's called synthetic substitution. The result of plugging in a value into a function is the same thing as dividing by x minus that value. It's identical. So 
If you want to, what you can do, you can look at this number and you can say, all right, well, this is really what coordinate here? What coordinate is this? Zero, three. Not zero, three. Which of the oh. coordinates? X or one? one. So look, look back at part A, guys. In part A, can you plug three in for X? Yeah. That's your X, isn't it? And what did you get as an answer in part A? You got 56. So this is your Y. So the first number on the outside and the remainder is your XY. Again, I don't care what the other numbers are. That's why I'm not writing them. Obviously, you have other numbers here and here, right? There's numbers there, but I don't care what they are. This and this are X comma Y. Okay, so again, the remainder theorem is literally that. The division by X minus C gives you the same remainder as f of c. Here, division by x minus 3 gives us the same remainder of f of 3. It's kind of useful to use this method um, when you're trying to come up with a list of values and you don't have a calculator for it. It's a lot easier, the math involved. Remember part A, you had to do 3 times 3 cubed. So that was 27 times 3 is 81. Then you had to sub subtract 2 times 3 squared, etc. If those numbers get any bigger, it gets really messy. Synthetic substitution, which is what we actually call this now, instead of synthetic division, because we're substituting a 3 in and getting a 56 out. Part A, we'll call that direct substitution. All right? So if you didn't know that term, jot that down real quick. Part A, we're going to call that direct substitution. Part B is called synthetic substitution. All right, so now the next theorem you know already, and it's just a corollary to what we just see. What we just stated was this. When you plug in a value into a function with direct substitution, for example, 3 you plugged in, you get the same answer as when you divide that polynomial by x minus 3 using synthetic division. That was the remainder theorem. This is a corollary to that. x minus c is a factor if and only if f of x, in this case, turns out to be 0, making it a root of the equation. Again, what is a root of the equation? What does that mean? A root of an equation. Okay, when y is 0, can we turn that off, please? When y is 0 or... What else? When y is 0, that works. In this case, it's an equation, though, not a function. So if I'm setting something equal to 0, a root of an equation is just a value of x that makes the equation 0 y is 0, but that's for a function, this was for an equation. So here what we're saying again is this, for f of x equal to 0, it would mean that this value here is 0. That's all we stated yesterday, that's what this corollary is, okay, the factor theorem. Let's use that factor. If x plus 4 is a factor of the polynomial, find the other factors Based on the factors, what are the zeros of this function? Work with the person next to you. Try and do this on your own. There's eight of you. Maybe, can Luca and Sabine, can you guys work together, please? The two of you will definitely be able to scan this. Okay, work with the person next to you. Try and come up with the answer to this. It's not obvious right away. You think about and talk about it with your neighbor what you should be doing for something like this. And try it. Try something when you talk about it.
you're really stuck, let me know. So raise your hand, I'll come over. I'm going to just put up what we're going to get. So when you run negative 4 through this, give me your numbers, Ryan. Read them across. Oh, um, 1, negative 5, negative 22. Oh, the next line. Oh, oh, negative 9, 14, 0. Okay, making this x squared minus 9x plus 14. Okay, this is... Write, write this down, please. This is called, do I call it depressed or suppressed? The depressed equation. D-E-P, like depressed, if someone's depressed. The depressed equation. Just meaning the second level, once you've divided by something. Now, if the remainder is zero, the depressed equation is a factor of the original thing we divided into, which was our function f of x. So as a result, we factored this further. What do we get when we factor this? To be Now, if those are the factors, that means that f of x is really this. x plus 4, x minus 7, x minus 2. 
We know x plus 4 was given. The other two factors we just determined. So that's what x, f of x looks like in factor form. Then we want to find out what the zeros of the function are. So we set it equal to 0. And we get x equals negative 4, x equals 7, x equals 2. Those are the three possible zeros of this function. Any questions on this? All right, next one. Talk about it with the person next to you for a second. This one is a little different. How are you? How are you? It's different in the sense that now you're not given a factor, you're given a root. So think about what you want to do with that. Here, did you vote? Okay, you're about to give some additional So find them to fill it in. Yeah. Okay? Every group did this really well. Good job, guys. So you're plugging in a 1. Whenever you're told that a number is a root, just plug it in. If you plug in a number and it's a root, you have to get 0 as a remainder. You know that already. But what's important is what comes about here. The depressed equation is what you really need. So you have to still run it through, even though you know that you've got to get 0 at the end. What do you got as numbers? Niall, what do you got? Uh, Fill in the box. One, Okay, and as a result, we get x squared minus 3x minus 18, x minus 6, and x plus 3. Now, I want the roots, don't I? So I know that these are two of the factors of the original equation. The other factor of the original equation was x minus 1, if I were to factor it. That's really what this original equation would have factored into. Well, we already got this answer, so there's no need to even include this piece here. We already have this one. And then the other two answers are 6 and negative 3. 
Had this problem... I want you to think about this. How would it differ? Had this problem said f of x equals, instead of 0 equals, instead of an equation, imagine it as a function. If it had said f of x equals, and it said find the x-intercepts, how would your answers differ? I was talking about this with you too. How would your answers differ if it said find the x-intercepts? Would you list these three as your answers? What would they look like? How would they look different? Okay, is that all clear? Because the zero is really the remainder. Remembering the zero is the y coordinate, <laughs> that's why you get a zero as a remainder. This is the coordinate, one, comma, zero. Let's see. Last example, then we're going to take a look at one or two other theorems we're just going to talk about. Determine if x plus two is a factor. This should be an easy one for you. Is it a factor, yes or no? Provide evidence. Okay, so we get negative 27 as a remainder here, and therefore it was not a factor. 2, negative 4, 1, 7. In this case, it really doesn't matter what these numbers turned out to be, because we weren't really trying to factor it anyway. We weren't trying to find the roots. We were just determining, is it a factor? So the negative 27 is what's important. Obviously, these need to be right, though, for negative 27 to be correct. But you don't need to do anything with that equation afterward. Okay? I'm going to just go through. Uh, Ryan, why don't you read the first one for us? Every polynomial equation with positive degree and has exactly n roots. And we've talked about this already, but this is one of the theorems that 8, 6 covers. And we've done so much, I don't even actually go through it. If it's x to the third, you can get three roots. If it's x to the fourth, you can get four roots, etc., etc., etc. And we already discussed the idea of this. We looked at quadratics that had two imaginary roots. What well, we're going to see soon about the idea where what if a cubic has three roots and two of them are imaginary and the third is real? Well, it still has three roots, but just two of them are imaginary. Okay? If something is to the fifth power, right, to the fifth power, x to the fifth, it could have four imaginary roots and one real. Because remember, imaginary roots come in what? What's the word? Pairs. Pairs. So you could have two imaginary roots and three real or four imaginary roots and one real, or all five real for x to the fifth. Does this make sense what I'm saying? x to the fourth power, what are your options for roots? For x to the fourth, what are your options? All four could be real, obviously. After that, what are your other options? All four imaginary. All four imaginary coming in two pairs, or? So two imaginary, two imaginary, two real. But the imaginary have to come in pairs, and the real ones are whatever's left over. Okay? Uh, the second one, uh, and that's the second one also. I didn't realize that was what the second one was. Okay? So the second one has to do with the fact that imaginary roots always come in pairs. Okay? A plus B I and A minus B I. Any questions on this stuff? 
After this, all we're doing is 8-7 tomorrow. Monday we're reviewing, and then Tuesday is the test. The test is pretty much all of chapter 8, but I don't cover 8-6. Eight, 8-6 six. Eight, six is pretty much this right here, which you guys know already. Okay? So after 8-6, or after 8-7 rather, what we do is we go back and cover 5-6, 5-7, 5-8, 5-9, the stuff on rational expressions that we skipped in the middle of the year. That's mainly going to be most of the material. Then we're going to start stuff on rational functions, which I've written my own notes for. It's like E1, E2, E3, E4. But I don't think they're up there. I don't think I do it as slides. I did it where I just wrote tight notes and handed out packets and we went over it together. Um, but the topic of rational functions is curves. Um, looking at curves on graphs. The topic you're going to learn in pre-calc and using in calculus itself. Nick. You use the function 1 over x a lot, where you see the rational function looks like this. Uh, yeah. The derivative is negative 1 over x squared, you know, the common derivatives. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a thing you're going to see in calculus a lot. It has to do with inverse variation, 1 over x. Okay, but a little bit more complex than just that. Rational functions are like one of the most common ones. Especially when you look at like average cost function for economics, that's a rational function. Average velocity for engineering, or average rate of change or any sort of science engineering application is a rational function. So we'll do that one toward the end of the year. Um, then we'll probably do one or two like small little like projects or like little labs, things that are just in class activities for the end. Okay? Anyway, you guys are welcome to start the homework in about 10 minutes, 11 minutes, okay? It's not long. Yeah.